sound speeds, and quite often I'm sent an email asking me if I'd like to test out a new audio product, and typically I reply with one word, no. Well, that is, unless I recognize the brand, or there's something in the email that appeals to me, and in the case of the Cinco Mic D2, it was the fact that it mentions various different places, including in the subject, that it is a budget option for an MKH 416 by Sennheiser. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the 416 has a legendary status. So if you're going to claim that you're a budget option for it, it's got to hopefully be pretty good. So I said, yes, let's see how this goes. Before we get going, let me say this. Cinco did send me this microphone in exchange for a fair review. I get to keep it afterwards, but I'm not going to allow that to affect my opinion. So you can expect this to be a fair and honest review. This is the box of the Cinco Mic D2 Short Shotgun Microphone. And unlike the 416, it's not a super cardioid pattern microphone. It is what's known as a hypercardioid pattern microphone. The difference is it has a slightly more directional front lobe than you would find on a super cardioid. And the rear lobe of sensitivity is slightly bigger on a hypercardioid. Inside the box, you'll find a carrying case, which I find to be kind of interesting, let the truth be known. Why? It feels very soft, yet it still is hard enough to protect the things on the inside. It looks cool on the front and back, and it kind of gives a little bit, so it's almost like cardboard laminated with something, because it does have a bit of a cool, kind of smooth feeling, in addition to looking cool. The nylon handle does have a rubber bit that's integrated into it, and the zipper feels very smooth. But continuing on the inside, when you open it up, there's foam on the top, and as for the bottom, it feels very much like cardboard with velvet on top. So it's like, what are you going for here? Inside the box, you'll find the Cinco Mic D2 short shotgun microphone, a clip allowing you to attach the microphone directly to a mic stand with 5 8 27 threads, an adapter allowing you to convert those threads to 3 8 16 for something like a boom pole or a boom arm, the windscreen that goes along with the shotgun microphone, a short pigtail, and of course you gotta have your little startup user manual type guide. The microphone itself feels very well made. It's not a nondescript metal like the 416. It is made of all brass, which I imagine does very good for RFI rejection. And notice it also has vents, slits, slots, whatever you want to call them, that are on a slight angle, not directly vertical or in line like they are on the 416. But it does have a speckled black finish, which is very reminiscent of the DDS Mic 2, as is the fact that it's made of all brass. So in all honesty, I'm tending to think them more like an S Mic 2 than a 416 when I feel this. The microphone clip is made of plastic with exception of the 5 8 threads on the inside. And it is pretty tight, but I imagine it would loose up over time. As for how it fits the microphone, it's extremely tight and I recommend strongly going in on one angle and threading it in there. Because if you try to thread it in this way, yeah, it's not gonna go. And if you push it in, it requires some elbow grease. But on the flip side, it's not gonna fall out now, is it? As for the adapter, it's an adapter. As for the windscreen, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a fan of it. Most windscreens are made of kind of a medium density type foam or sponge material, if you will. But this one is very velvety like. It feels very smooth and velvety. And it looks cool, but I'm not sure how acoustically transparent it's going to be. Also, it gives me very much an impression like it was drawn through a machine and then cut off square. Not just because the cut on the top is very square, but because it is not evenly done. If you rotate this around, it kind of is lopsided. When I first took it out, I put it flat on a table and it kept falling over until I realized that it wasn't cut square. And as for how it fits on a microphone, I will say two things. Number one is when you slide it on, be careful. There's a lot of a loose fit to it. If you go like this, it's going to come off. It, it just hit my hand there. So it doesn't, I mean, like that wasn't very much force at all. That was even less and it's still sliding off. So you might want to consider adding a rubber band or something on there just to keep it on. And also note this. Watch how much it presses in if I go straight on the front of the windscreen. Now, that may not bother you, but the more foam there is on the top, which is about that much, it's almost an inch, that's quite a bit of space in front that's going to potentially muffle the sound. The short cable it comes with does not impress me in the least. I mean, I guess it's kind of cool that the cable wrap has its brand labeled on it, but as for the pigtail itself, it's thin XLR, not branded. There's no words on it at all. And the connectors, those are kind of an imitation type Neutrik connector, but they're also unbranded. Now that I've taken them apart, I'll be completely honest with you. Nothing really throws any red flags. I mean, the solders do look very, very clean. The ground is tied to the casing on both the male and the female end. And there's really nothing in here that throws any red flags. The cable is just a standard cheapish type cable, so it's not Starquad or anything. But sure, I might give this a try in something like a Zeppelin. As for the user manual, I'll say 
that it's actually one of the better ones I've seen lately. It's got a very smooth appearance to it. It feels good. It's got a tale of contents, kind of cool graphics. It talks about what should be in the package and the packaging list. It talks about features and the introduction to them, how to care for the microphone, the polar pattern, frequency response, a really cool 3D type thing. It talks about the specifications or as they call them parameters and even how you can use the microphone with different types of cameras. All in all, I would say this is actually one of the more impressive ones I've seen out there. One thing I did notice is that the specifications listed on paper are different than they are on their website. For example, sensitivity on paper here is negative 30 dB plus or minus 3 dB. On their website, it's negative 29 dB, so it's a little bit more sensitive. As for the output impedance here, it's listed as 450 ohms, and online, it's 500. Now, granted, that means it's a DC bias microphone, most likely, and it's a little on the higher side than you would normally find on a short shotgun microphone. So if you're using some sort of a portable recorder, it may not drive it properly. But then the rest of it is pretty much standard. Now, it does say ultra low self noise, but in all honesty, it's, I calculated it, it's not listed at about negative 14 dBA, which is higher than it is on a DDS mic 2 and an MKH416. So as for ultra low, I'd say it's just kind of average. Of course, nothing tells you how a microphone sounds more than listening to it. So why don't we start off with a noise floor test? I know Cinco is going to want me to compare this to the Sennheiser MKH 416, and I'll do that. But I also am going to compare it to a microphone I mentioned earlier, the Deity S Mic 2. I find them to be very similar in not only build, but I also find their nomenclature to be the same. Like, for example, Deity S Mic 2, Cinco Mic D2. I mean, to me, they sound very similar in name, not just in the design of the microphone itself. So why don't we compare them all three together in kind of a voiceover type configuration, and I'm not going to tell you which one is which until afterwards. For starters, I'm only going to be about six or so inches off of the microphones. This is a pretty respectable distance to be off of a shotgun microphone in a voiceover type environment. And if you're wondering why I'm looking ever so slightly down, it's not because I'm depressed or because I'm intentionally trying not to look at the camera. It's because I'm trying not to kill the microphones with plosives. Notice there is no windscreen on any of these microphones. And yes, I could be slightly off axis to the side, but I figured coming in straight at my face is a much better test for these microphones when they are all point blank or rather you know, six or so inches off mic. Now I'm only about two inches off of these microphones. I'm really engaging the proximity effect in this configuration. And notice I'm still directing my voice very much downwards as if I'm reading copy, which I could do very comfortably in this configuration. But I do want to point out that if you do something like that, be very mindful of your vocal cords, because if you crush them, it will be changing your voice and you don't want to do that. Now I'm about one foot away from the microphones. That's not swallowing them, engaging the proximity effect, nor is it at a relatively close distance like you're just speaking regular into it. At this distance, I might yell. I might do something loud like I typically am. And in that case, you would want to back off on the microphone just a little bit so that that way you're not killing it and probably sending it well above clipping. So which mic do you think was which? I'll tell you, the Sennheiser MKH416 was number one, the DDS Mic 2 was number two, and the Cinco Mic D2 was number three. So which one did you like the most? Tell me in the comments below. Now, you remember hearing me earlier when I said I was a little bit concerned about the windscreen? Why don't we also test how it sounds with and without the windscreen in this kind of a controlled environment also? The microphone is pointed directly at my mouth at this time, and I'm not currently using the windscreen. But now I am using the windscreen, and this is how much detail you have with the windscreen on, versus how much detail you have with the windscreen off. So definitely pay attention as I switch back and forth, and if you don't like what the windscreen does to a voice when you're speaking into a microphone, then take that off and apply a different windscreen or just use something like a pop filter. But you don't have to use the windscreen at all if you're shooting in a place without any wind. And watch that video right there if you're not familiar with the technique I'm speaking of. But if you do like the sound of the windscreen or just don't want to mess with it, then you certainly can wear the windscreen on the microphone. I mean, this is the one that it comes with, so it's obviously the one that the designers picked out for it. We now know how the Cinco Mic D2 does inside of a controlled environment like this, but what about how it sounds in the real world? Well, why don't we throw a few real world comparisons at it and see how it compares to the Sennheiser MKH416 and the DDS Mic 2 in those environments. To give you an idea of how loud this location is, you're listening to the camera mic. And right now the camera's only about 15 or so feet away from my mouth. For 
For our first test, we're exterior in a very noisy location. Behind me is Interstate 85, and directly behind camera, there's another very busy road. And the microphones are only about two and a half or so feet away from my mouth, kind of like they were coming up and over the top of a camera doing ENG type work. Also in ENG style, it's very common to come up from underneath, under booming like you see I'm doing right now. And one of the reasons why you would also do this is if you were casting shadows on top of people, or you just for whatever reason wanted to try to eliminate a background noise. But right now, this is the way it sounds if you're under booming only about two or so feet away from my mouth. Now the microphones are directly over the top of my head, and if we were in a very loud environment such as this and shooting, you would really hope to get a microphone right on top of the frame to get the very best possible signal to noise ratio. Now the microphones are only about six or so inches off the top of my head, and this is about where it'd be on a medium or wide shot. If your camera operators want you to hold any more than that, it's probably for something like VFX. They want to hold extra room around the frame just in case they need to shift around or reframe in post. Now the microphones are about one foot over the top of my head, and if you're hearing any wind on the mic, that's perfectly normal for this time of year. It is right now December, only about 10 days or so until Christmas, and the winds are very, very active in the south here in the winter, when you don't want the winds to be active. And the summer, when you want the wind to be there, it's not. It has other things to do, like probably be at a beach. 18 inches over the top of my head is where these microphones are now. And to give you an idea, that's about two feet away from my mouth because you gotta keep in mind that not only do you count the distance over the top of someone's head to the microphone, you also count from the top of someone's head down to the mouth too. That counts too, because it's still distance off the mic. The microphones are now two feet over the top of my head. The higher they go, the more background noise you're gonna start to hear in the signal because it's, remember, signal to noise ratio. My voice is what we're hoping to pick up with the microphones and the background noises, not so much. So you're gonna wanna listen to rejection on these microphones the higher I go. Two and a half feet over the top of my head and you're really gonna start to have to dial in on the fidelity of my voice. That is the crispness of it. How well it kind of almost draws a line around my voice keeping it away from the background. If you were to see a very, very thick, bold line, like with a Sharpie on paper, that's kind of the, the idea of behind rejection and, and distancing from a background. The microphone does very similar type things, but does it more acoustically. Now three feet over the top of my head, you're really gonna start to run into swirling winds. Winds that speed along the ground are gonna start to swirl as they start slowing down. And at this height, the microphones are gonna be starting to pick up some of that swirling pattern that's gonna be hitting them. So you gotta really start to keep in mind that if you're using any kind of microphone outdoor in the wind, you might consider getting better wind protection than the foam windscreens they come with. Now at the end of the first segment of this ambient QS boom pole, which is approximately four feet over the top of my head or nine feet off the ground. And at this height, you're gonna really hear more of the background noises, but then that's kind of unfair to say because now the cars seem to have kind of come out from nowhere. They're all over the place on the road behind the camera and on, on the road behind me, Interstate 85. I guess you really can't see them a whole lot, but they are definitely up there too. Going into the next segment on this ambient QS boom pole, and now the the microphones are five feet over the top of my head, which is pretty much about the edge of where you would really want to ever use a shotgun microphone, or short shotgun at least. And if you had a lav on in a noisy environment, by now you'd probably already be playing it. Unless, of course, you felt like being bold or you're matching some sort of a shot that was not done at the same size as a tighter shot. Now, six feet over the top of my head, you're really gonna start to hear more winds hitting the microphones. Sorry about that, but then that is the nature of what we're doing out here, right? Now, remember my concern about the windscreen on the Cinco D2. Well, if it is indeed resisting wind a little bit better than expected, it's gonna obviously be curbing the highs a little bit, but then is it enough to really warrant getting something like a softie or a wind killer? You be the judge. Now seven feet over the top of my head and it is not currently as loud as it has been out here, which is a good thing because you need to be able to hear my voice. But as we go higher, start to remember that the background noises around me are gonna to start to be more in front of the microphone as opposed to behind or to the side of them being rejected out. So the higher we go, the more on axis they're gonna be, which is not necessarily a good thing. Now eight feet over the top of my head, we're getting to the very edge of the second segment of this ambient QS boom pole. And at this point, we're getting very, very high up in the air. So so you're gonna really start to hear my voice falling off of the background noise quite a bit at this distance. Now we're closer to 10 feet over the top of my head and the higher we go, the more you have a tendency of speaking up if you're recording yourself. Actors on the other hand will not speak up because they don't want to affect their performance and if they do try to speak up a little bit, chances are a director's gonna say, why are you yelling? You don't need to yell, speak at a normal volume. 
so they completely ignore the background noise, which is wonderful for us sound people. We are now maxed out at the end of this ambient QS boom pole. And if you've watched my reviews in the past, you know that I also have an extra segment here because I use a QP120 extension on this pole. But I'm not gonna go higher than this because I want you to get an idea of how it sounds when the microphone is 12 feet over the top of my head or about 18 feet over the top of the ground. Now, I'm gonna lower my volume to a normal speaking voice at this time. And if you could hear me at this distance, the chances are it's because the microphones are pulling me up pretty well. You're hearing background noises all over the place, you're hearing planes overhead, and probably occasionally wind hitting the microphone. But at this location, we are now done with this test. Going to a quieter one now. Here we are at our second outdoor location. And to give you an idea of how noisy it is out here, let's switch over to the camera mic. I like this background noise a lot more than with the other set. For our first test, just like with our noisy location, we're kind of coming up at about a 30 or 45 degree angle, just like you would if you were coming up over the top of the camera. As I always say, ENG style. For our second test, we're coming up from underneath underbooming. And just so it's been said, even if the microphones do not look like they're on axis to my mouth, they are. Trust me on that. I'm a boom operator. I'm used to pointing microphones all day long. And even when I point a microphone someplace and then direct my eyes elsewhere, I still know which way my hands are and how they're holding it. So I know the microphones are always on axis. The microphones are now directly over the top of my head, like it would be on a tight shot. And if you do listen in the background, you will hear that there is an airplane flying overhead, but I'm not that concerned concerned about it because even though I'm not speaking as loud as I was in that noisy environment which is just a natural thing that if you're recording yourself for something like YouTube you will be louder especially if you're loud by nature like I am to speak up louder in noisier environments than you normally would. The microphones are now only about six or so inches over the top of my head and signal to noise ratio is still working to my advantage because it is so quiet out here. Keep in mind the more noises there are around me the more those are going to be preventing you from hearing whoever speaking on camera or on mic. Now the microphones are only about one foot over the top of my head. The signal to noise ratio is very much working in my favor. If I had my SPL meter out here, it would probably be telling me that this environment is only about maybe 35 or 40 dB. It's not very loud at all. That's one of the reasons why I love living here. Now the microphones are only about 18 inches over the top of my head and we're still very much getting a good signal to noise ratio because it is so quiet out here. And of course now the wind is going to be popping up a little bit and nailing the microphone. Sorry about that. But then we are doing an exterior test and still it's not as bad as it was when we were next to the interstate. Sharp-eared people are going to be noticing that since I'm holding the pole vertically in these tests, you're going to be hearing a more handling noise than you would be if I were laying the pole sideways. And that's gravity working to our advantage when it's horizontal and disadvantage in this circumstance right now. See, if I wiggle this around, you can definitely hear the cable on the inside of the pole and maybe even a little bit as it shifts around the outside of the pole. But if I were laying it horizontal, gravity is going to be helping us out there. Now, two and a half feet over the top of my head, the mics are all about three feet over my mouth. And at this distance, you're going to start to get on the edge of the fidelity. So start really listening for which microphone sounds crispest, which one has the most definition and detail in it. That's when you're really going to start to notice it is as it starts to get on the edge of the distance of where you would really want to be using the mic. Obviously, you'd probably want to be using a lav at this point if it were noisy. But in here, in this environment, if it was a shot that at least matched the perspective of the camera, you can easily get away with using a boom on this. Three and a half feet now over the top of my head and the noise floor is really impressing me a lot. As a matter of fact, I shot here from my invisible boom video way back in the day along with a few other ones, but I haven't shot here a lot recently. I guess I should be shooting more for my exteriors out here because it is such a quiet environment and this is only about a mile or so away from my house, so it's not like it's a very far distance for me either. But even at three and a half feet over the top of my head, you're hearing the detail on this microphone just fine. Now we're at the end of the first segment of this ambient QS boom pole, which is about four feet overhead. And just so it's been said, if you were shooting in this kind of environment and it were noisy, you wouldn't be hearing nearly as much handling noise as you are hearing because this pole is in a quiet environment and I'm going directly overhead. Again, sorry about the handling noise, but you're still able to hear the fidelity of my voice just fine even at this distance. So I'm not overly concerned about it, but bear with me on this test. Even in this quieter environment, you're going to start to hear the wind now that the microphone is only about five feet over the top of my head. And that's to be expected. I mean, I'm not using any extra wind protection. I'm using the stock wind protection that each microphone came with. Now the microphones are about six feet over the top of my head. And if you notice, I'm speaking up a little bit just naturally by nature. I know the microphones are farther away from me, so I want to speak up to be heard. Hey, there's human nature for you, especially in someone that likes to hear their own voice. 
Now that the microphones are seven feet overhead, you're really starting to notice one other thing that you weren't noticing in the noisy environment, and that's reflection coming off the ground. Not only are you hearing my voice coming into the microphones directly, but you're now gonna probably start to hear it a little bit reflecting off the ground. You might have been hearing it before this point, but now you're gonna start to hear a little bit more of it, and so that's something to keep in mind as we go higher and higher up. Now we're eight feet over the top of my head, and the signal to noise ratio is gonna start to waver just a little bit, as the background noise level is naturally going Going to start coming up into the microphone more as is the fidelity in my voice is going to start to diminish ever so slightly now the microphones are 10 feet over the top of my head and if i got out of sync there there was a little confusion here about which heights we were and what i was calling it but i'm sure i corrected it in post if there was any issues now we're at the end of this ambient qs boom pole the microphones are 18 feet over the top of the ground or about 12 feet over the top of my head at this point we basically maxed out on this boom but i'm still because it's so quiet in this environment gonna do one more additional height test and we're gonna go full stick on this boom just because we can but to give you an idea of how my voice sounds if I'm not speaking up at my full Allen volume this is the way I am if I speak at a more normal volume I guess to a normal person but as you know I normally have a tendency of speaking up a little bit louder than a normal person now don't you okay I know you're thinking it you also know I'm not that normal not often that you hear someone testing a microphone 17 feet over the top of their heads but then you get that on this channel. 23 feet over the top of this ground because of this ambient QS boom pole inside of this ambient QP120 extension. But at this point, we're at the end of the poles, we're at the end of our test doing exteriors, and the sun is now starting to fall just a little bit. Oh, but it's not because of sunset like it has been in other videos, it's now because of cloud cover. So let's go back to the studio and we'll finish up some more tests. Now we're shooting it in a very quiet yet reverberant room. To give you an idea, this is what the camera mic sounds like in this room. For our first test, the microphones are about 30, 45 degrees up and kind of over what it would be like if it were over the top of a camera. Again, we use this in the film industry all the time. It's not just something used for ENG, but that's still how I refer to it. Now we're coming up from underneath, underbooming, as you've heard me say many times before, kind of ENG style, even though there's many different styles and we use them in the film industry quite often. Now, the way that this is currently facing me, it's reflecting around this entire room. When I come directly overhead, the only real balance that we're gonna be catching is off of the ground and back up. But right now, we're catching it off the back, off the ceiling, off the floor, pretty much over everything. The microphones are now in a best case scenario, directly over the top of my head. And this is exactly where you'd want it to play. You're gonna get maximum signal to noise ratio and optimal fidelity from this interference tube. And when I say this interference tube, I mean all of the interference tubes, but whichever one happens to be on at that particular time. But let's go up a little bit and see how it starts to fall off in this reverberant room. The microphones are all now about six inches over the top of my head. Still a very good position for microphones to be in. Medium, wide shots, this is about the height they would probably be. Now keep in mind there is no carpet in this room and it's pretty bare bones and reflective all over the place. This is a garage. What do you expect out of it? Now about one foot over the top of my head, remember this is about 18 inches over my mouth, you're gonna start to hear it get a little bit more echoey and reverberant throughout this room. And this is when you're gonna really wanna to start to pay attention to that rejection. Not just how well you're hearing the fidelity in my voice, but how much it kinda of sounds reverberant, echoing over top of all the dialogue that you really care about. And in this case, you wanna actually try to hear my voice. I mean, you may not want to in reality, but in this test, you definitely do. Now, as the microphones are about 18 inches over the top of my head, I naturally feel myself talking up a little bit louder. I guess because I feel the need to be heard, even though in this particular environment and with this very low noise floor, it's not really an issue. I mean, I've killed all the noises around, so you shouldn't really have a hard time hearing me, yet the louder I go, the more echoing you're going to be hearing. Now that the microphones are about two feet over the top of my head, you're going to start to hear more reverb. And not just because the microphones are higher and picking up more of the walls and ceiling reflections around me, but because each of these patterns, supercardioid or hypercardioid, has a rear lobe. And that rear lobe is going to start to play off the ceiling a little bit the higher we go. This is the second to last height that we're going to be taking these booms in this room, two and a half feet over my head. At this point, you're hearing quite a bit of reflection throughout this room. Hopefully, you're still picking up my voice in great detail that these microphones microphones should really want to be picking up my voice in. But is it too overwhelmed by all the reflection in this room? You be the judge and tell me in the comments what you think. 
Now the microphones are on the ceiling, three feet over the top of my head, and at this point, the rear lobes of the microphone patterns are picking up maximum amounts of noise because basically it's catching reverberations directly off the wall and dissipating them, kind of, you know, diffusing them, so to speak, and then putting them directly into the microphone. And as we know, a microphone is the sum of all angles of sound that comes in from all the different directions summed into one little bitty source. And that's basically what we're dealing with in this location. So now let's go into our last location for our testing. This is the last room we're going to be using to test the microphones in for this video. And while you're listening to the noise floor off of the camera mic, I would like you to think really hard and try to imagine what time of year you think I'm shooting this video in. No, it's not August. For our first test, the microphones are about two feet in front of me. What I refer to as ENG style, as you well know by now. And to give you an idea, I am standing on a carpeted floor. It's a fairly big room, and directly behind the camera, the room extends into the kitchen that you've also seen me shoot in for things like the destruction of the EV664 videos. But this is our first test. Now we're coming from underneath, underbooming. The reason why I mentioned that the kitchen is in there is because there's a lot of hard surfaces in there for the sound to reverberate off of. Things like hardwood floors, marble countertops, and even the hard walls on the cabinets. All of those things reflect sound, and because I'm speaking up loud enough for them to reflect back in here, and the noise floor is low enough, you're going to be hearing some of those reflections even at a distance of only about two or so feet away from my mouth. Here's our best case scenario. Tight framing to the top of the headroom would allow me to put the microphone right on the edge of frame, which is in this position right here. This is optimal fidelity for these particular shotgun microphones. Each one of them is only about six or so inches away from my mouth, and my mouth should sound about as good as it's possibly going to get when overhead miking in this position. Now the microphones are about six inches over the top of my head, and if you've been watching this entire video and wondering why some microphones are sticking out below or above others, it's not actually the case. Those are where the windscreens are, and I guess you could say, well, if you're going to be doing this the right way, you'd be counting the windscreens because that's the area that would actually have to be out of frame. That's a true statement. However, for this test, we're just testing the wind protection that comes with each of these microphones, and we're putting the interference tubes at the same height. Now with the microphones one foot overhead, we're about halfway between my head and the ceiling at this point. And that's because the ceiling is not as high in here as it is in my garage. But that's okay, you should be able to hear me just fine. And the higher these things go, the more you're going to be seeing all my Christmas decorations behind me, and of course the 3D map of Middle Earth that is on the wall. 18 inches over my head and you're still having no problem in the world hearing my voice. It is a very quiet room, and my wife and daughters are all out seeing a movie. And so I'm here at the house shooting sound speeds videos because that's what I enjoy doing when I have no interest in the world of watching the movie that they went to see. And that is pretty much the way things go in my household. I stay home quite a bit while they go off and have fun, or I'm out at work. But regardless, I'm still doing sound stuff, so it's all good. Second to last stop now with the microphones about two feet over the top of my head. And even at this distance, you're not going to have a hard time hearing me in a quiet room like this. But you're going to start to lose a little bit of that fidelity and that low end in my voice that you were catching when the microphones were much closer. So at this point, really start to listen to how much bass is lost as they start to go higher and higher up. And I guess we only have six more inches for you to listen to. Now two and a half feet over the top of my head, these microphones are on the ceiling as far as I'm concerned. And I do need to apologize that you've heard a little bit of rattle, a little bit of wind noise in this test. But then, as I've said before, that's the nature of this test, isn't it? Now before we go back to the studio, I'm going to make a point to speak in a regular speaking volume. This is me if I were talking in a regular type of volume, as if I'm just having a casual conversation with you. And naturally, by nature, I'm usually pretty loud. So this is a bit difficult for me to do. But hopefully this has been a decent enough test for you to hear how these microphones sound at these various different heights. Back to the studio now. So now that the testing is complete, I hope you've written down in the comments below which microphone you thought was what number because I'm about to reveal which one is which. Starting with number one, which is the Cinco Mic D2. Number two is the Sennheiser MKH 416. And number three was the DADS Mic 2. How did you do? So let me share with you my thoughts and findings. First of all, it is a $250 microphone. That is a quarter of the cost of the Sennheiser MKH 416 and $100 less than the DDS Mic 2. And for that price, you can get some good sound out of it. It's got a solid build quality and feels really good. I also tried my best to get some sort of cellular Wi-Fi transmitter interference, but it resisted it all. The mic does not have any roll-off high shelf or pad switches on it, nor can it be battery powered. But to me, most mics don't, so that's not really a deal breaker. Although I suspect that it's a DC biased microphone, moisture had no effect on the microphone whatsoever when I recorded a 15 minute session with the microphone in the bathroom while I steamed it up from a hot shower. 
The Synco Mic D2 also does a pretty good job of rejecting out unwanted off-axis sounds, which is one reason why it sounded so good when it was really high over my head. As I mentioned, you can get good sound out of the Synco Mic D2, but when you compare it side-by-side -side with the DDS Mic 2 and the Sennheiser MKH-416, you notice a few things. Like, for example, the flat frequency response is a bit too flat. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but believe it or not, I think a presence boost would actually go a long way to help it sound better. When you're in a voiceover configuration, you can't help but notice that the mids sound nasally, and when you're close miking, the bass sounds a bit muddy and overpowering. Luckily, both of those are relatively minor things if you know how to EQ, and if not, watch my video Cutting Through the Mix and I'll help you get started. What can't be corrected is a slightly lower amount of detail and clarity from the capsule. When you listen, it sounds more closed off, like it's trying to hear through a thin layer of something. You can hear it sounding more diffused than crisp, especially when I switched around to different microphones in the test. Usually, expensive premium microphone parts sound very open and clear, but for the price point, I would say that they managed to put together a pretty decent mic. I would not recommend using the included windscreen for any reason. Sure, it looks cool, but it muffles the sound way too much even if it does resist the wind better than a regular foamy does. That's something I would recommend for Cinco to change because I was pretty impressed with the packaging and presentation until I saw the windscreen, and then I couldn't help but overanalyze everything. Another recommendation I have for Cinco is to look over the specs listed on the website. They don't list the self-noise spec online or even in the paper manual, and stating that the bass is built in is just plain hilarious, but then, so is mentioning that it's a back electorate three times. In closing, I wouldn't say that the Cinco Mic D2 compares to the Sennheiser MKH 416. Nice try though. What I would say that for a budget of $250, it is a good mic to consider for a vocal booth or even for field recording, but get a different windscreen. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Sound Speech. Be sure to tune in the future for more product reviews and sound advice. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.